Okay, guys, I want to do a quick video and point something out to you guys. Um, Washington 65 had sent me an email talking about the, the dates, the birth dates and the ages of Netanyahu and Rivlin, uh, President and Prime Minister of Israel, and how they seem to coincide with the Psalm 9010 prophecy. Um, and it really does. And uh, she did. she's done a couple of videos on it, and Barry did a video mentioning it, and he's talking about how... Um, Brother Chooch, he knows, uh, he's got an idea, and he believes we're looking at a summer time frame. Uh, I do too, and I actually found some interesting stuff on this. And when you take into account Psalm 9010, when you take into account there are certain prophecies that have to be fulfilled this year or next year. After that, they can't be fulfilled anymore. So there's timestamps on these prophecies, and this is based on other prophecies and things that are happening in the world. So they have to be fulfilled now. Uh, otherwise, they're going to make God out to be a liar. <clears throat> when you take into account all the signs that we're seeing and all the prophecies that we're seeing ready to be fulfilled, but they haven't yet. Everything's kind of at a standstill. When you take into account the peace deal being pushed, now of course this may not be the one the Antichrist uses, but it's the likelihood that this is the one he will use. He'll change it to make it suit him and reaffirm it. Extremely likely. 97.9% .9 likely. Um... When you take into account all these different things, take into account that Jesus and his crucifixion fulfilled all the spring and early summer feasts. Take into account that the his return, his second coming, is going to fulfill all the late summer fall feasts. Where does that put the rapture? The rapture obviously isn't going to fulfill the fall feasts. That's what his second coming is for. He came the first time, it fulfilled all these. What's in between those? Summertime. Um, April to September looks like a good time frame. Maybe even closer than that. But I haven't dug into more of the dates. I told you guys, he's going to let us know. But other people don't see this. People that are non-believers don't see this. Those that are, those that are watching, do see these things. And it's just, it's very interesting to me to see in 2019, all the different dates we were picking, everybody was looking for these dates, all the signs we were seeing. But look now, now we have very specific information coming out. And nobody saw this stuff before. This stuff now is all now just coming to light. That's Holy Spirit working. So I did a search for summer, and I found some interesting things. Now this may seem like grasping at straws, but when we take it all together, um, I don't know. You be the judge and you decide. But it's quite obvious looking at the things that are going on today that, you know, if there was... If we could ever pick a really close time, like if last year wasn't close enough, it looks like the summertime is going to fall into that thing. And we're just seeing too many things telling us this. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. So in Genesis 8.22, it says, While the earth remains, sea time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Now, some of these scriptures aren't going to make sense at first, but as we move through, you'll start to see it. In 2 Samuel 16.1, when David was a little past the top of the mountain, there was Zilba, the servant of Mephibosheth, who met him with a couple of saddled donkeys, and on them 200 loaves of bread, 100 clusters of raisins, and 100 summer fruits, and a skin of wine. Um, I'm not sure what the cluster of raisins is referring to, but I know that does have a reference. I just didn't look it up yet. Um, what do you guys can and, and comment on it? But saddled donkeys, Jesus rode in on two donkeys. Uh, and on them, 200 loaves of bread, Jesus is the bread of life. And a skin of wine, Jesus, his wine is the blood of the covenant. 100 summer fruits. Who could be the summer fruits? We know who the first fruits were in the spring. We know who the late harvest is going to be. The Bible tells us that. Quite specifically, who's the summer harvest? You should start to see where I'm going with this. When it dawned on me, I was like, okay, well, that makes sense. Because if on both ends of the summer, if that stuff's going to get fulfilled by specific events, one's already been done, the other one's coming, what happens in the middle? Something has to happen in the middle. And another thing I want to point out, if they sign this peace deal, what do you think they're going to be saying after they sign it? Peace and safety, peace and safety. And then sudden destruction. Watch. Second Samuel 16, 2, And the king said to Zilba, What do you mean to do with these? So Zilba said, the donkeys are for the king's household to ride on. 
coming back on ho white horses, the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine for those who are faint and the wilderness to drink. If you really think about what that's what that could be referring to, it should start to stand out to you. And this is still coming together for me. Psalm 32, 4. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. When you see, remember I told you before, you see Selah, it means pay attention. You're speaking something important. You have to pay attention to it. Everybody was tired. Vitality here. Everybody was tired. Everybody's exhausted. Everybody's worn out. Everybody's beat down. Drug out. But then summer came. Get delivered. Uh, Psalm 74, 17. You have set all the borders of the earth. You made summer and winter. Proverbs 6. Eight, everything in the Bible has a meaning. Proverbs provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. A few more. Proverbs 10, 5. He who gathers in summer is a wise son. He who sleeps and harvest is a son who causes shame. He who gathers in summer is a wise son. Really? Hmm. It's not capitalized, but hey, it still could mean that. Proverbs 26 1 as snow in summer and rain in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a fool. Okay? I'm just going through these. Because we're working our way up to something. Proverbs 30, 25. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their food in the summer. Provides her supplies in the summer. Now this one's real good. We're going to go look on this one a little closer. Therefore, I will bewail the vine of Sibma with the weeping of Jazer. I will drench you with my tears, O Heshbon, O Eliah. For battle cries have fallen over your summer fruits and your harvest. That's an interesting statement to make. For battle cries have fallen over your summer fruits and your harvest. Peace and safety and then sudden destruction. We have war going on now. Or cries of war going on now. Let's go look at this one. It's Isaiah 16.9. So there it is. So what is he talking about in Isaiah 16? Send the lamb to the ruler of the land, from Selah to the wilderness, to the mount of the daughter of Zion. For it shall be as a wandering bird thrown out of the nest, so shall be the daughters of Moab at the fords of the Arnon, the Arnon River. Take counsel, execute judgment, make your shadow like the night in the middle of the day. Hide the outcasts. Who are the outcasts in the world right now? Christians, do not betray him who escapes. Let my outcast dwell with you, O Moab. Be a shelter to them from the face of the spoiler. I think there's another scripture somewhere that tell, says the spoiler is Satan. I'm not 100% sure. For the extortioner is at an end. Devastation ceases. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. In mercy the throne will be established, and one will sit on it in truth. In the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking justice and hastening righteousness. Who is that? That's Jesus. We have heard the pride of Moab. He is very proud of his haughtiness and his pride and his wrath. But his lies shall not be so. Shall not be so. Therefore, Moab shall wail for Moab. Everyone shall wail for the foundness or foundations of Ker Haresh, Ker Hareseth. You shall mourn. Surely they are stricken. For the fields of Heshbon languish, and the vine of Sibma, the Lord, lords of the nations, have broken down its choice plants, which have reached to Jazer and wandered through the wilderness. Her branches are stretched out; they are gone over the sea. What does that sound like? That's to sound to you like he's describing. For the fields of Heshbon languish, and the vine of Sibma, the lords of the nations, have broken down its choice plants. Now refer that description to. What we're doing, the grace preachers, the church, Christians in general, which have reached to Jazer and wandered through the wilderness, her branches are stretched out, they are gone over the sea, stretching into all corners of the earth. Therefore I will bewail the vine of Sibma with the weeping of Jazer. 
I will drench you with my tears, O Heshbon and Eliah, for battle cries have fallen over your summer fruits in your, har in your harvest. Gladness is taken away, and joy from the plentiful field. In the vin vineyards there will be no singing, nor will there be any shouting. No treaders will tread out in the wine presses. Tread out wine in the presses. I have made their shouting cease. Everything changed. He brought an end to everything. This sounds like it's talking about end times. Let's keep going. Because uh, actually, it, I looked ahead, it, it, it puts it together a little more. Isaiah 18, 6. An oracle concerning Cush, woe to the land shadowed with buzzing wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, which sends ambassadors by sea, even in vessels of reed on the water, saying, Go swift messengers to a nation tall and smooth of skin, to a people terrible from their beginning onward, a nation powerful and treading down, whose land the rivers divide. All inhabitants of the world and dwellers on the earth, when he lifts up a banner on the mountains, you see it. And when he blows a trumpet, you hear it. Interesting series of words. For so the Lord said to me, I will take my rest, and I will look from my dwelling place like clear heat in sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. For before the harvest, when the bud is perfect, what, what was he talking about in the fig tree? We're actually going to go to the fig tree parable. Or, uh, yeah, the parable. Was he talking about the fig tree when it's, when it's budding? When the bud is perfect and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, he will both cut off the sprigs and pruning hooks, with pruning hooks, and take away and cut down the branches, killing the developing Christians, maybe? There they will be left together in the mountain, birds of prey and for the beasts of the, beasts of the earth. The birds of prey will summer on them, and all the beasts of the earth will winter on them. In that time, so now he's saying this is actually something that's happening. In that time, a present will be brought to the Lord of hosts from a people tall and smooth of skin and from a people terrible from their beginning onward, a nation powerful and treading down, whose land the rivers divide the, uh, to the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, to Mount Zion. Is he talking about end times? We know how prophetic Isaiah is. Is he talking about end times? I don't know. That's interesting. This this stuff stands out. Isaiah 28, 4. The title of this chapter is Judgment on Ephraim and Jerusalem. Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower which is at the head of the verdant valleys, to those who are overcome with wine. Behold, the wine of abominations, maybe? Behold, the Lord has a mighty and strong one, like a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, like a flood of mighty waters overflowing, who will bring them down to the earth with his hand? The crown of pride, the drunkards of Ephraim, will be trampled underfoot. And the glorious beauty of the fading flower, which is at the head of the Verdant Valley, like the first fruit before the summer, which an observer sees, he eats it up while it's still in his hand. In that day, there's that phrase again, the Lord of hosts will be for a crown of glory and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people. I can keep, keep reading through there. You see more and more uh, allegory referring to what we think it's referring to. It's referring to the end times. Uh, Jeremiah 8.20 Uh-oh. Hold on just a second, guys. Sorry about that. Okay, um, we're in Jeremiah 8, 820 is where we're supposed to be. So let's scroll down. I don't want to read you the whole thing and bore you with all the details. Jeremiah grieves for his people is the name of this last group of verses. I would cover myself in sorrow. My heart is faint in me. Listen, the voice, the cry of the daughter of my people from a far country is not the Lord in Zion. Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images, with foreign tools? The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Who's still going to be here after the rapture? For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. I am mourning, astonished. Astonishment has taken hold of me. Is there no balm in Gilead? That's also referring to Jesus. Remember, uh, in another scripture, he was referred to as the balm of Gilead. Is there no physician there? He's also referred to as the physician. 
Why then is there no recovery for the health of the daughter of my people? I mean, this should be kind of kind of obvious what's going on here. Because what happens after the rapture? All everything falls apart. And then the time of the judgment of, of Israel comes. Let's keep going because there's more. Let me get these positioned here so I can see them. So Jeremiah 40, 10. Jeremiah remains in Judah. Actually, there's a couple of them. Let's see. And Gedalia, the son of Ahakim, Ahikim, the son of Shephan, took an oath before them and their men, saying, Do not be afraid to serve the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. As for me, I will indeed dwell at Mitzpah and serve the Chaldeans who come to us. But you gather wine and summer fruit and oil and put them in your vessels and dwell in your cities that you have taken. Likewise, when all the Jews who were in Moab among the Ammonites and Edom and who were in all the countries heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant, remnant of Judah, heard that the king of Babylon had left a remnant of Judah, remnant of Judah, and that he had set over them Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shepham. Then all the Jews returned out of the, all the places where they had been driven. Listen, then all the Jews returned out of all the places where they had been driven and came to the land of Judah, to Gedaliah and Mitzpah, and gathered wine and summer fruit in abundance. They returned from all the places they had been driven, which happened in 1948. And this one here is a little bit more out there as far as what it's referring to, so it, it doesn't 100% link to what we're talking about. But then we're going to go to 12, Jeremiah 48.32. Let's see. Judgment on Moab. Let's see. Let's start here in verse 28. You who dwell in Moab, leave the cities and dwell on the rock. And be like the dove, which makes her nest in the sides of the cave's mouth. Dwell on the rock, huh? Petra? We have heard the pride of Moab. He is exceedingly proud of his loftiness and arrogance and pride and of the haughtiness of his heart. That sounds like the Antichrist. I know his wrath, says the Lord, but it is not right. His lies have made nothing right. This is the Antichrist. Therefore, I will wail for Moab, and I will cry out for all Moab. I will mourn for the men of Kerheres. O vine of Sibma, I will weep for you with the weeping of Jazer. Your plants have gone over the sea. They reach to the sea of Jazer. The plunderer has fallen on your summer fruit and your vintage. The plunderer has fallen. That'd be Satan. Joy and gladness are taken from the plentiful field and from the land of Moab. I have caused wine to fail from the wine presses. No one will tread with joyous shouting. No, or not joyous shouting. So it sounds like everything goes haywire. Everything falls apart. You keep reading through here and you see it just gets worse and worse. All right. Daniel 2.35. Yeah, even Daniel's got something in it. Daniel interprets the dream. <laughs> what dream was this? Oh, wait. This was the dream of the big statue. It was gold and silver and all the different metals going down. O king, you, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image, the great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you. And its form was awesome. This image, image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Watch what happens here. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. While a stone was cut without hands, the unhewn stone, wonder what it was. Some people think this is an asteroid. Listen. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold 
were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. There's the whole interpretation of it right here. So, and as the toes and the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. We know this is referring to end times. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. There's a lot of different stuff people talk about of what this stuff is referring to. How interesting that summer, again, is loosely connected to end times. Uh, let's see here. Amos 3.15. Israel's guilt and punishment is the name of the chapter. More end times? Maybe. Um, let's start in verse 11, but I think we could actually do the whole thing. Uh, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an adversary shall be all around the land. He shall sap your strength from you, and your palaces shall be plundered. Thus says the Lord, as a shepherd takes from the mouth of a lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out who dwell in Samaria in the corner of the bed and on the edge of a couch. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, says the Lord God, the God of hosts, that in the day I will punish Israel for their transgressions. I will also visit destruction on the altars of Bethel, and on the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. I will destroy the winter house along with the summer house. The houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, says the Lord. He made it very specific point to mention, I will destroy the winter house along with the summer house. That's not referring to houses. I believe that's allegory for something else. What would that be? It's interesting study there. Guys, there's all kinds of hidden stuff in here. Amos 8.1 Thus says the Lord, uh, see, thus the Lord God showed me, behold, a basket of summer fruit. Look at the title, The Coming Day of Bitter Morning. A basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? So I said, a basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, The end has come upon my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. Yeah. What did the summer fruit have to do with the judgment of Israel? Hmm, I don't know. Let's read a couple more verses down. And the songs of the temple shall be wailing in that day. So he's linking it to a specific time period says the Lord God. Many dead bodies everywhere. They shall be thrown out in silence. Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail, saying, when will the new moon be passed? That we may sell grain and the Sabbath, that we may trade wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver, and the needy for a pair of sandals. Even sell the bad wheat. What's he talking about? He's not talking about wheat and sandals. He's talking about the people during this time frame. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall the land not tremble for this, and everyone mourn who dwells in it? All of it shall swell like the river, heave and subside like the river of Egypt. Earthquake! Big earthquake! And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down at noon and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. I'm starting to get an idea that maybe the poles are going to shift suddenly after the rapture. Let's read a few more. I will turn the feast into mourning and all the songs into lamentations. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only sun and its end like a bitter day. That Actually, that baldness was listed in one of those other ones in Jeremiah we were looking at. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. Actually, that was in Jeremiah 48.32. If you read further down, I think it was 48.32. Um, it was talking about baldness. The days are coming, says the Lord, that I will send a famine on the land. Who remembers this? Not a famine of bread, nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Remember that prophecy? Of hearing the words of the Lord. Not reading, hearing. Who's preaching right now? 
They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They shall run to and fro seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. In that day the fair virgins and strong men shall faint from thirst. Those who swear by the sin of Samaria, who say, As your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. Basket of summer fruit. And that's talking about destruction. A couple of the other ones we went through did the same thing, didn't they? <clears throat> this may be grasping at straws, but it is speaking. All right, now let's do Micah 7.1. Woe is me, for I am like those... Or wait for the God of Salvation is the title. <laughs> <laughs> Woe is me, for I am like those who gather summer fruits. Like those who glean vintage grapes, there is no cluster to eat of the first ripe fruit which my soul desires. Is he talking about fruit? The faithful man has perished from the earth. Wait, what? And there is no one upright among men. They all lie and wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net. What do you think? What do you think the world's going to look like after the Holy Spirit is taken off here? After the restrainer is gone, mass chaos. Everyone is going to kill everyone. That they may successfully do evil with both hands. The prince asks for gifts. The judge seeks a bribe, and the great man utters his evil desire. So they scheme together. The best of them is like a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman and your punishment comes. Now shall be their perplexity. I find this interesting. The day of your watchman and your punishment comes. Do not trust in a friend. Do not put your confidence in a companion. Guard the doors of your mouth from her who lies in your bosom. He's talking about everybody going to sell everybody out. For son dishonors father, daughter rises against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. Therefore, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Summer fruits. And it's talking about stuff being taken. It's talking about destruction on Israel. Hmm. Zechariah 14.8. I hope somebody else is seeing what I'm seeing here. It's kind of deep down in there, but it's there. The <laughs> Title of the chapter, The Coming Day of the Lord. Well... See how it's building up and explaining what that... Guys, I'm just reading it. But it's speaking to me. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, and your spoil will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two, from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move towards the north, and half towards the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Azal. Yes, you, <coughs> you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. He's time stamping this event. A lot of people say all this stuff happened way back then. Well, obviously he's time stamping it that it didn't. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. It shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light. The lights will diminish, remember? Day of gloominess. It shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time it shall happen that it will be light time stamping it again and in that day it shall be that living water shall flow from the Jerusalem from Jerusalem half of them toward the eastern sea and half of them towards the western sea in both summer and winter it shall occur now that's not talking about summer fruits but interesting that that's mentioned in here and look at what it's talking about okay now we're going to get into the last three and these are the parable of the fig tree listen to this this should bring it all together for everybody. In Matthew 24, 32, we all know Matthew 24, don't we? 
The lesson of the fig tree. Now learn the parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. What all did he describe in Matthew 24? He described the rapture. He described the tribulation. He described the second coming. Assuredly, I say to you, verse 34, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. That means this is a time stamp on the age, this end event, and everything has to happen within this time stamp to make these prophecies and these statements true. Psalms 90.10, a generation is 70 years, 80th by strength, but its boast is labor and sorrows, and then we fly away. So we have to see this stuff unfold literally in the next few years in order for it to be fulfilled properly. It has to. Now God can do what he wants, but he doesn't change his stuff like this. If this has been put into writing, he's not going to change it. It will go just like this. Verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Mark 13, 28. The lesson of the fig tree. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Luke 21.30 Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. When they are already budding, well, when Israel came back into the land in 48, it was building. In 67, they got Jerusalem back. It became the budding tree. And it has been maturing ever since. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Look how specifically these three different guys at three different times in three different parts of the region wrote down the same statement. Almost verbatim. But look at the details. Interesting that Luke has a little bit different detail in there. They are already budding. When they are already budding, you know that summer is now near. Interesting that all three of them mentioned summer. You know that summer is now near. Why summer? What's happening with summer? I think that's kind of ironic that that's mentioned in there in that particular parable because Jesus fulfilled everything in the spring and early summer with his crucifixion and ascension. The, his second coming fulfills everything in the fall. You can literally go through the Bible and link it to the feast that's going to, it's all going to happen on. And in some cases, it even gives you the time of year. So you know that it's matching that. What's in between those two time frames? Because during the summer, nothing happens. And remember what we found out about um, the new wine? How they were celebrating Pentecost in the spring and they shouldn't have, early summer, and they should have been celebrating it in, in early fall, late summer? because they missed an entire 50 Sabbaths that they needed to add, or 50 days. And when you do that, it puts it literally when they have new wine in Israel, literally right when they have new wine, because in the early part of the year, they don't have new wine. All the wine's getting old. The harvest for the new wine is in September, October. August, September, October. That's where the new wine is. So that's when Pentecost had to have happened. Just by the words being used in the statement, it has to be that at that time. There was no new wine because there was no grape harvest in the spring. They're celebrating Pentecost the wrong time of year. It's actually near the end of the year. Or near the end of summer. August, September, October time frame. Usually August, September. So that's when new wine is available. So that's when those guys, because they asked them, hey, look, they're drunk on new wine. Well, they wouldn't say that unless new wine was available. 
because they were making an accusation. That means that that had to happen that time. If that's the case, that would be at the very end of summer when all the last harvests come up. They also figured out that when they did, they did the wave offering. You have to do the wave offering for the new harvest in the spring before um, Passover. Well, how could they do that when they were harvesting the winter crop that they planted at the end of the year prior? Go, go look at their how they did that. I actually did a video on it months ago. So they would have been taking it from a winter crop that they were harvesting. Well, they couldn't do that. It had to be at the new meat. So when would they do that wave offering? Pentecost. After the summer planting. Because they planted the new one in the spring, harvested at the end of summer. Then they planted another one and went through the winter time into spring again. So a whole bunch of stuff. When you go back and read in Leviticus and, and um, Leviticus... Deuteronomy, somewhere else. You go read that, how that's laid out, and then start looking at when they put their harvest in. It's like, wait a minute, something doesn't make sense here. This has been celebrated wrong, and it's meant to confuse everybody. But what they do is, when spring comes, there are no crops, except for the winter crop has just been brought in. They're planting the spring crop, and the spring and summer crop. That matures. The end of summer, they're about to harvest the wine. They're harvesting wheat. They're harvesting barley. Go look at it. Last year, you could see that people were, were putting in videos about it on YouTube. That's when the wave offering is done for Pentecost. Then they have their new wine. Then they harvest, at that harvest, they plant the winter crop. That goes all the way back around to the beginning of the next year. Then they have to harvest that one. Because it, 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 the term that messes everything up is it says the, the new meat. The new grain, not the old one. The winter stuff is the old one. Little details like that start to chip away at what we've been taught all this time. And after knowing that, then going in and looking at stuff like this, it's like, wait a minute, something's not right here. Because now I'm getting a completely different time frame given to me than what other people are saying. So, and without getting huge three-hour video, going back over all that information I've already covered, what can we deduce from this? To me, summer is our time. I don't know when in summer, but summer is our time. And after it happens, everything is going to completely fall apart. And what I'm thinking, just from what we read in these scriptures here, it's going to be right near when the right near the end of summer. August, September, October time frame. Probably sometime in uh, July, August time frame. And then everything falls apart after that. Because we can't, what, the rapture of the church has no markers around it. It's a standalone event for a specific group of people. So we have to we can't be near the, the fall feast, the end of summer and fall feasts. Those have to be fulfilled by who? Jewish people in the tribulation. Just my spin on it, guys. Do what you want with this information. Do deeper digging in here. But what I'm seeing with everything that we've been shown and putting it all together, it tells me that summer is our time frame. And the highest probability is this, this summer. I'm not putting a day stamp on it, but just from what I'm seeing, yeah, this this look it looks like it'd be this summer. So what are we to do with this information? Well, we research it, we dig deeper, we don't let it get our, get us all wound up and get upset. We go at this with sober minds. We've been watching for how long, and we already know these things are coming because the Bible told us we're not to be afraid, we're not to be bent out of shape, we're not to be upset, we're to stay sober minded on this and try to reach as many people as we can. Obviously people aren't going to believe if we say, yeah, we're probably going to get raptured this summer. Obviously they're not going to believe that. Most people have knowledge about this stuff. They know about these things, but they don't want to face it. So we get the gospel, the simple gospel. You need to believe. Just believe. And everything will come apart from there. Everything will come together from there. That's all they need to get them started. Once that happens, the Holy Spirit will show them everything else. But to the non-believer, this is complete nonsense. They won't believe anything you tell them as it concerns this. What do we see? We, we, see, all, we see all the things in place. All the names, all the people, all the players in the game, everything, all the events are all set and ready to go. It's just a matter of time. And guys, when they sign that peace treaty, 
Watch what they say after that. All the headlines, all the headlines you're going to see. Peace and safety. Peace and safety. Peace and security. That's what you're going to see. All the headlines. They're going to put it in big, bold letters. They're going to announce it worldwide. Everybody's going to cheer. Just like that, everything changes. We're taken out of here, and the whole earth comes apart at the seams. And if we see them pushing that hard, saying, we're going to have, have it out before March, because I think the, the elections are in March or April. Aren't they March? Or no, maybe they're April. They're going to have it out before the next, the, the third round of elections for Israel? What does that tell you? Then everything flies apart. Summertime, guys. That's what I'm looking at. April to September. So, sometime in there. Anyway, do what you want with this information. Do your own studies. Don't believe me. Don't take what I'm giving you as, as gospel. Go look it up and read it for yourself. Do your own searches on this stuff. If you guys haven't downloaded eSword, you're, you're, you're killing yourselves. Da it's free. Download eSword. The only thing you pay for is you can donate to them or you can buy different little Bible apps up here at the top. You can buy different versions of the Bible to click through them. I recommend getting the King James and the King James Plus minimum. I think those are free to download. And then I got the new King James and the ESV. But that's all you have to pay for. And, and it's cheap and it's online purchase. It's just it's data that they add to the program. But it's free. And it allows you to search the entire Bible without having to pour through the Bible literally seconds to learn this stuff and to see this stuff and to help you understand more. And you'll see exactly what we're seeing. And guys, this is it. This is it. I mean, if it doesn't happen this year, it would be shocking with everything we see unfolding around the world. And that's not to say God can slow it down. But I don't know. I don't know. It sure looks like we're ready to go. I love you guys. I bless y'all in Jesus' name. Keep looking up. It's almost time to get out of here. I'll see you in the next one.